reason I ended up here. My boss has calmly cut my life away. I was an afterthought, and all for what? Your victory here is assured. You no longer have anything to lose, so isn't that enough for you? Remember, Rock, you're nothing but a pawn in this game, too. Just step aside. There's something exceptionally striking about the opening to Black Lagoon that you've probably never thought about before. Rock's entire character depends on his backstory. This fall from a usual life to the criminal underworld is what begins his conflict and relation to Revy. It's the basis for how he connects to the often parallel villains and how he feuds with the contrasting ones. The magic of anime's best character piece is reliant on where Rock comes from. Despite this, there's only 37 seconds spent on exploring this time in Rock's life before the series begins proper. For one of the most well-developed protagonists in media, this feels odd. But it's a smart decision which required Hero having a good grasp on the human condition. The despair Rock feels at his menial life is something almost a priori. When he expresses how abused he feels, eaten up by the system used for all his worth, and then tossed away and expected to take it, before fighting back, winning in glorious fashion and thrusting himself into the beautiful sunset of a new life, it feels hopeful, it feels relatable, it feels like something we all want to do. It's freedom, right? When the track Teardrops to Earth plays, I find myself overwhelmed with a sense of freedom. It feels like the open sea, the serenity of being on your own time and in your own place, unbound from the overwhelming nature of the world. He's a pirate hanging out with maniacs, but it's his decision, his life is his own, and this new city, he's making of it what he will. At least, it seems. The beauty of early Black Lagoon, culminating in probably the best episode, Calm Down Two Angry Men, is in crafting and then breaking down this sense of freedom. Never again after episode two does Rock delight in his victory over a foe. Never again does he make a physically crazy plan that would result in such a thing. That moment which seems almost out of character for him by the end is an instant high, the illusion of freedom. After coming down, he discovers the truth of his new situation. He's relegated to half babysitting Revy, serving as the brains to her brawn. And she takes him to task, making clear there's an order here. She exists above him. And despite the change of scenery, he's still primarily a businessman. Marked by the suit she hates so much, he's forced to fill the same role as always, just in a different context. His value is still determined by the same way, by how much money he can make for someone else. It's just he now serves someone new. He watches people try to be free and suffer for it. He witnesses the enforcers of a harsh order which hoards freedom and distributes it unequally. This new world relies on the same principles of the one he left. The once seemingly open nature to his life has led him to the same path. The only true difference here is how immediate death may be. Rowanapur and his home are quite alike. One has simply given up on appearing civil. Almost immediately, Rock feels limited once more, culminating in his fight with Ravi where he famously and aptly states, I thought I was done with kissing ass for a living, but here I am at the ends of the earth, and now I'm supposed to be kissing your ass? What kind of sick joke is this? We'll get back to that feud in a moment. First, we have to take a look at Revy, what she represents, and what Rock is rejecting in that outburst. Revy is the darling child of Roanapur. She's crass, violent, a brute force respected by all, but she's unmanipulated by the usual means like many others. She doesn't serve the gods of Roanapur, power and capital. She embodies them and their principles. She is power-seeking compensation. When Chin screws them, she deals with it through an arsenal of weapons. When they enter the Nazi submarine, she takes everything of value. Now, we've covered before why Revy does this. She's a logical being at heart in the way of a pessimistic realist who never knew stability. As a child, she was afforded no care, no status, no anything. There are many reasons for this, but boiled down, we find two simple principles. She lacked power, like the police force or her father, and she lacked money, a way to buy herself out of the situation. People who weren't like her were so for having one of those two things, often both. So when she starts anew, she begins with power, killing her father. She grows that potential into a way to make money as the feared gun of the Lagoon Company. She has solved the equation of avoiding pain according to her childhood. So has she escaped the system to become free? Has she cast off the bounds of society and found somewhere great? Is the answer for those who feel out of place to become ruthlessly engaged with the principles that bind them? I don't think so. Because despite this all, Revy hates herself. 
The defining feature of her character in the Fujiyama gangster paradise arc is this, as she silently reaffirms to herself that she is unworthy of the kind of calm life she wishes Rock would find a pathway to and take her with him. She has avoided pain, but she hasn't found happiness. She has succeeded, but her success is only in becoming that which abused her. I think it's telling that the woman constantly beaten as a child is prone to lashing out against children in the series. Revy hasn't really succeeded in becoming free. She only avoided one alpha outcome of her life for another. I don't think I really need to spend much time explaining that Revy isn't free. Roanapo is not somewhere that pirates out on the open ocean experience a lack of this world's bindings. What we'd see instead is a rebranding of them. In the world Rock came from, there were certain guarantees. For example, he had an exceptional degree of safety and almost guaranteed employment. However, those came with associated costs. Say, dangerous activities some may consider enjoyable are limited, and that guaranteed work comes with the almost other guarantee of being overworked. He won't be killed on the street, but is he actually even living? As we've explained before with Psychopaths, society is a trade-off of free will for freedom. You exchange the possibility of doing everything for the guarantee of doing some things. As such, Roanapo is not somewhere which is somehow more free than Japan due to a lack of restrictions. Rather, it is just having a different contract. Dangerous activities are obviously permitted, but you also have a high chance of being killed for a drink at the local bar. You can receive a high pay grade for work considered illegal in most other places, but there's no guarantee of it, and there's no guarantee you'd live to spend the money you make from it. Revy is a highlight that this shift carries with it no inherent happiness or freedom. As Rock wished for something outside of his world, she wished to be removed from hers. Despite this, Revy is the perfect encapsulation of Aranapur. In her mental speech, she espouses what the City of the Dead considers to be truth. By stripping away much of the performance and nicety of modern society, they see this as somewhere more free. You don't have to watch your tongue, you can bribe the cops out of anything because no one acts like money isn't everything. And if someone crosses you, you just kill them and be done with it and move on, living your life having ended theirs. The medal itself is the lesson. Throw away the sentimental bullshit and keep what matters, the money. This isn't freedom, it's just tossing out the act of Rock's work. So when Rock lashes out at her saying, I didn't make any mistake. I have nothing to apologize for. It's not simply a rejection of Revy and her principles, but of Rowanapur and its false idea of freedom. Rock is a smart guy. His strength is analyzing the world around him, knowing how it works, and eventually manipulating it to his advantage. As an outsider who's found himself in much the same role here as he had at home, he recognizes that this place is no more free than the one he left, but is simply a repackaging of the same principles in a less traditionally palatable way. Does recognizing that money rules us really make it any better? Does being able to kill someone in your way make you more free when you know the same could happen to you at any moment? Either way, human societies are adapted from the same principles. They don't necessarily have many distinctions, but rather a different coding to imply the appearance of a greater degree of freedom. We can see this in Rock's desire to leave his world behind for Oranipur after the adventure of the first two episodes. Walking towards the Lagoon Company in a beautiful sunset, a smile on everyone's face, it seemed like the change he wanted. The appearance worked. It's the same with Revy. She represents this bare-bones nature to the city as a kind of freedom, even knowing deep down that she hates it. She secretly wishes for Rock to escape the darkness of the city, so she has a means to escape herself. But by being harsh as she is, trying to pound the lessons of her Ranapur into Rock's head, by killing everyone who goes against the gods of the City of the Dead, she's trying to convince herself of her own freedom. She's trying to put reason to the pain she felt in the past and the methods she took to correct it. She's looked at a new world which offered to fix the issues of her past and provided the things she lacked, and she entered it. But she hasn't found any peace or happiness she might have hoped for. The human brain is designed to compensate for survival and looks at these contradictions and wishes to solve them because the smartest way to live is to be sure of your situation. We want to believe that we are free. So with Rock and Ravi, with Japan and Rowanapur, these contrasted extremes in both cases, we see some of the same things. An illusion of freedom and not much more. So what's the lesson here then? Conventional wisdom would stop here, saying that the world is inherently unideal and that we must make peace with our situations because we can't change the world. And there is some good reason for this. The trade-offs of free will for freedom in most of our societies are quite positive. I don't think many of us would rather be on a farm from sunrise to sundown just making food to survive. 
I don't fail to acknowledge that I have a solid roof over my head and food on my table, and many people don't even have those things. We've made many advancements towards freedom, but all of human history is seeing things you're unhappy with and trying to better them. By saying that we should simply make peace with the world is saying we should stop advancing. Saying we should be happy because others have it worse only prevents us from bettering our situation to then be able to help them. We have to take the advancements we've made and determine why there haven't been more. Black Lagoon seems to embark down this path by showing us its characters that Rock both sympathizes with and contrasts against. It presents us with the issue which robs both of our extremes of advancing their freedoms, and that is the treatment of freedom as a limited commodity. What I mean by this is that freedom is not distributed equally, and some have more privilege to take it than others. With that privilege, those individuals then have a vested interest in keeping freedom as such a thing and will use their power to do so because it affords them more opportunity. We can see such people in both Rock's origins and his present. His former boss, Kageyama, is the first example. One of the higher-ups whose directions serve to remove Rock's life of any character, he's hated by those under him in the same breath as they wish for his position. As Rock explains directly, I hope to be in his place someday. It's the only way to maintain your sanity here. Here, there is only one escape, upwards. But the key is in the name. For him to exist on an upper level, there have to be those under him. What people like Kageyama wish for is a delicate balance, a workforce that's exhausted enough they can't move upwards, but not enough that they fall down. Stable enough they can make it in every day, but always on the edge of having that ripped away. Looking upwards to maintain their sanity in the hopes that one day it will all pay off, because there's no other option. The freedom of one depends on the work of others, so why would he ever want others to have freedom? In the way his world is structured, it would only reduce the options available to him. As such, freedom becomes hoarded by one. Naturally, in Rowana Pur, we once more find Balalaika as our example. Much more directly than in the normal world, she acts as an enforcer of freedom's scarcity. No more is this more present than with the Romanian twins. We've covered them in depth, and it's a story much too tragic and rooted in real history to be completely summarized here, so I'd recommend viewing that video to fully understand this one. I've made no money from it, it's not monetized, so I'm not saying that for my own gain, but for a genuine respect for one of the darkest chapters of modern history. The twins are a pair which had never known even a basic semblance of freedom. In the orphanages where they lived their earliest years, many children never even knew the outside of their own crib, let alone the sky above them. Eventually, they were sold to the Mafia where their confinement continued, growing even more atrocious as they were raped and forced to kill for their own survival. As far as they knew, the only humans who survived were ones who killed others, and this explains their strange mindset on eternal life. Crafted into monsters for the benefit of others, their example of freedom as a commodity has already begun. For the Mafia to make more money, that is, to buy more freedom, they can find and grievously mistreated these children. But it continues as they reach Roanapur. Here they're given their first small degree of freedom, leashed for another's goal, but able to enact it with their own methods. As such, they get carried away and deviate from their initial task of killing Balalaika, instead killing and torturing her soldiers. This is fucked up, but as far as Rowanapur functions, this is freedom. Those in your way are killed. Balalaika is as familiar with these principles as anyone else. With Chang and the other family's head, she's one of the ones to apply it most liberally. They always see an issue when someone else does so. Because to them, that means that party is expressing freedom, which when you treat it as a limited commodity, means the opportunity for theirs would be lessened. It's fine for her to start a war for not even her own gain, but simply her enjoyment, but others doing so for any reason is forbidden. In a combination of enforcing this principle and genuine care for the men she fought through hell with, she brings the hammer down upon the twins. They're made an example, one bleeding out in agony before her, and the other shot from behind just as they caught their first glimpse at even the most basic principle of freedom, the sky above their head. Their tale is tragic in many ways. But one of the most striking is the fact that their entire lives were used for others. They were born for a dictator who wanted human capital for industrialization. They were sold to rapists who abused them for monetary gain and sick pleasure. And just as they began to glimpse at freedom, to use their lives for themselves for the first time, they were brutally killed just as they had been taught to do. They are an extreme example. Some lives exist for nothing more than to secure the freedom of others. Getting back to Balalaika, the agent of their destruction, we find this principle at work in another way. 
We see how people become jaded through these systems, content to rise through their ranks and enforce the same principles which harmed them earlier. Again, I have a dedicated video which explores the backstory and history of this in detail that I'd recommend checking out for a full picture, once again one I'm not making monetary gain from. But Balalaika had privileged beginnings. Despite her father's unlabeled disgrace, her grandfather was a high-ranking member of the Soviet military, and we can see her surroundings were much more comfortable than what many would have experienced for the time. However, she was tossed out from that level of society, told that she could compete in the Olympic Games for marksmanship to restore her father's honor, but that she'd have to train first. And train she did in the Soviet-Afghan War. A feudal conflict that only exacerbated the fall of the Soviet Union, she was discharged for saving a refugee child on an ordered illegal operation, returning to a doomed country with her life in ruin. She is the prime example of a sort of cannibalism among the freedom hoarders. The Soviet-Afghan War was a pointless excursion by the Union which served only the interests of a few in the upper levels while sending the children of others to die. In our current systems, as the degree freedom rises, so does its cost. But that cost at those levels is always offset to others. So for a war only a few people wanted, some 15,000 of their citizens had to die. I also say cannibalism because the cost can even be those usually exempt as Balalaika was. She was one of the elites remorselessly tossed under the boots of what she could have become, same as her father likely was. Later on, after she decided to embrace war as her purpose, we can witness how powerful this enforcement of limited freedom is as a system. Even when the thing she wishes for more than anything else, what she calls honest wartime combat against a worthy foe is right in front of her. She can't take it because she is part of this system. She could have fought Shane Caxton, the kind of enemy she'd wished for years, finding her truest ideal of freedom, the thing her life was about. And she doesn't. This is a purposeful consequence of the system. The potential for hoarding freedom becomes more important than freedom itself. The reason you began doing it in the first place is lost. This is because of a lesson she learned similar to Revy's. While the latter's option was to find somewhere else which seemingly ignored such systems, the former was to become one of the agents of it. Morenapur is so similar to the rest of the world because there are still those who are hoarding freedom in charge, Balalaika being one of them. Seeing the suffering caused by such people, feeling it herself, she decided the best option was to become one of the ones who did so, so it couldn't be wrought on her again. It's supposed to be dastardly, it's designed to be something which would disgust someone with good intent. Those who would distribute freedom after acquiring it are kept out either by their own disgust or the enforcement we've already talked about by people like Balalaika and Chang, leaving only the ones who seek unadulterated self-fulfillment to the reins. This is especially true in Ruanapur, where only the merciless are able to succeed. But is it really any different than Rock's past? Kageyama directly sends Rock to death for his own gain and essentially does the same for others who work themselves to death for him. The process isn't much different, it's just slower and more palatable. A different branding as we've kept saying the whole time. We can see a proof of this with Yukio. Now, I'll quickly mention we could also do a lot of the same with her and Rock, but I'd rather focus on her parallels to Balalaika here. She's similarly privileged, not overly rich or affluent, but someone who would never have to struggle for anything in life until the entrance of our deranged former Soviet. Because her father was a Yakuza boss, she was forced to be one by antiquated rules and traditions, the same as Balalaika was made to fight to restore her father's good old Soviet honor. The biggest difference between them, and part of the reason why they take such different paths from these initial conditions, is intent. They reach different conclusions from the situation of being forced to fight for someone else's gain. Yukio decides on a path oriented to change. She seeks to escape Rowanapur with Ginji with the intent to provide justice to the damned city, sending her current clan underground to save their lives. While it's partially an excuse to flee alongside someone she loves, it still remains a somewhat more moral option than Balalaika's. And this, along with inexperience and lack of resources, is why Yukio meets a different end. Those fighting for something will always have a weakness compared to those fighting simply to hoard, another reason why those who climb are those who hoard. This is stressed with Genji fighting Revi, Yukio's strength fighting rocks, respectively. What kills him is a moment of hesitation brought on by Yukio's words. Even though it was a split second, it's all that was needed for established evil to destroy potential justice. And that's the entire reason Yukio was even fighting in the first place. She was established to be the head of the Washimine clan to make it susceptible to a weakness. It worked. She was torn down and killed by a woman who once lived the same life. 
a woman who understands the false principle, someone else's freedom is just freedom which isn't yours. Balalaika didn't get to escape, so she does no one else the favor. Fighting back against this brand of corruption is the next logical step, even as we've seen with Yukio that it's dangerous for those who do. But for more than just ourselves, we have to be careful. For some of other Black Lagoon's characters, we can see the potential for this goodwill to turn ill. This is where we find Takanaka, who I'll give the same previous video mentioned to. Starting in the student movement protest in the 1970s Japan, he fought against one of the most true and tested tools used to protect the hoarding of freedom in most of our societies. Apathy. Most of them have a distinct status quo that's either positive or negative, or likely neither, depending on their viewpoint. It sits somewhere in the middle, appealable to everyone in some way, a point where we recognize things could be better, but don't find them awful enough to need change. It's complacency, admitting you could fight to live more free, but that it would be such a long and hard fight that by the time you won, it wouldn't feel like it was worth your effort. This, along with exterior pressures, of course, is what led to the end of the protest Takanaka took part in. This allusion to the fact the place he'd finally found purpose was dissolved and disgusted at how his fellow citizens had returned to what they had been fighting against, he grew much more extreme. It's implied he joined the Japanese Red Army, a terrorist group which committed one of the most heinous attacks of the modern age, the Lod Airport Massacre. Eventually, he becomes what we find in the series, a man lost in his own battle, fighting for nothing real. He keeps fighting, knowing full well his actions will never change the world. However, as long as he fights, his life has some semblance of purpose, the potential for it, no matter how obscure. And so he continues, fighting for the sake of fighting. A man who wished for a better society now acting as a pointless merchant of death. What we find in Takenaka is a highlight of how much of today's topic is a function of human nature. We find two sides which despite being reached through entirely distinct ideals, function with the same lack of a true purpose. We find a man who became hateful to the status quo before forming his own internal version of it. We find a man who fought for freedom, now quashing it for nothing more than his own sense of self. There's a warning in him that a delicate touch is needed to push for greater freedom. There aren't many ways to achieve such a thing without first limiting freedom to some degree. A protest, for example, is an expression of this, to assemble and use your time to present a grievance. Because of that principle, it's very easy for such things to get out of hand, to be swept up like he was in some romanticized idea of a revolutionary, a self-serving goal much like hoarding of freedom. I think there's a great reason Takenaka doesn't die. Death would have been too kind for him. Each day he lives is another where he has to justify his own life, which deep down he knows has no purpose. Takenaka lives as a warning. In seeking only to destroy what we hate, and not to build something more valuable, there lies only pain. Rock is somewhere between all of this by the end. He's continuing Yukio's goal of destroying Rowanapur, employing more dastardly means in his own desire like Takanaka, utilizing his hold over others like Balalaika, and allowing himself to be what he hated for power like Revi. He's the everyman once again in a very different sense. Black Lagoon is an amazing series because Rock is a true combination of what he experienced. He witnesses everything, takes in all the pain caused by Rowanapur, and uses it as ammunition to destroy the city of the dead. And he fails. Rock is a cunning manipulator. But he's a failure. He's a villain. It's clear that one man, even with a flawless plan, couldn't break the shackles of the world which made him. And I say world, not worlds, because as we learn, where Rowanapur may be separated from the kind of world he once knew, they aren't so distinct. It survives because other places, other forces above him willed it to. This situation was no different from any other he faced. Rock grew and changed, but the world around him refuses to do the same. It's here I find Rock's relatability doubled down on once again. Whether for revenge or retribution for those he saw killed or a genuine care for other people, he wanted to make a change, he wanted to craft a world where he could feel truly valuable, stopped at every turn by those with undeserved power. There is no satisfaction in his life. The effort he puts in is there for a moment, only to be lost to the winds of ill will. He continues on, left somewhere in the twilight with no clear direction of which way he'll go. He doesn't save the world or end it, he simply exists. There is no answer to the myth of freedom that we're presented with. And that's why I've been sitting here for hours trying to end this video. 
but there really isn't a good way. Black Lagoon is incomplete. We have no way to know if Rock or Revy or anyone else will ever be able to define something as freedom in their lives. But there is one thing for certain. Not much separates our heroes from our villains. Everyone exists in a grave zone, awful people, but ones we can understand. I think one factor we can point to that helps separate them is their desire for freedom and if they recognize our points today or not. Rock feels sympathy for the twins because like him, they only wanted to be free and they knew no other ways. He hates Balaika and Chain because they desire to prevent the freedom of others and they do no other ways. He may misread Revy, but he never abandons her. He relates much more to Takanaka, but leaves him in the dust. He sours on Yukio when she begins to compensate to Balalaika's methods when she begins to learn the same lesson. In every tragedy he watches, there are those with sympathy and those without for a reason. None of them have the power required to fully change the situation around them. But if they were all aware of how freedom was being treated, maybe they could understand each other more, see that their fighting had no purpose except maintaining the things they all hate. And that's why I'm okay leaving this video without some grand message. All that's here to do is to get some people's minds on their own freedom, to consider the things we usually take for facts of life in a different light. Things only are how they are if we think that. So be free to think about freedom. As always, likes and comments really help both the algorithm share the video and me help it, me help and help me improve my content and know your thoughts as well. There's important links in the pinned comment, most importantly my Patreon, where we've been gaining a lot more lovely supporters right now that you're seeing on screen. Anyway, I'll just say thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you again soon.